Welcome back to more Warhammer lore. In today's episode, we will be delving into the mighty Dawi yet again. This time, however, focused primarily on their army and fighting tactics, as well as their inclusion in Total War Warhammer 1 and now Total War Warhammer 2. All the information from this video will be taken from the latest Warhammer Fantasy Army books, the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, and the Warhammer Fantasy Novels. So that is all the source material. <laughs> and with that out of the way, let's get into the actual army and fighting tactics of the dwarves. So first, let's start with tactics. You see, the Dawi are among one of the most seasoned and elite fighting forces in Warhammer. You could say the elves also hold this title, but the main difference is that all, every single Dawi is trained and serve their hold in battle, no matter their title or station. Could be the lowliest person in the hold to the most seasoned veteran, including the king himself. Everyone defends the hold. This has effectively made every dwarven hold a military fortress built and manned by seasoned troops that are not only adept at fighting, but also much too stubborn to ever admit defeat. Which is why they do specialize in a particularly brutal style of combat. The Dawi are the immovable object. They are the stone in the river, forcing the tide of their enemies to break upon them. You see, Dwarfs and Warhammer are not exactly known for their speed, but they are known for their strength and determination. And in that vein, a very defensive style of warfare is employed to take advantage of their strengths. But an enemy army could simply stay out of reach and completely cripple this plan. Which is why the Dawi, more so than any other race, rely heavily on artillery and skirmishing, which does sound a little odd when you think about dwarves. Their stout, resolute shield walls of dwarven heavy armor wielding runic weapons can't hurt what they can't catch. <laughs> But if you start blasting swaths of the enemy's army from extended range, you give them a reason to not only close distance with you, but often recklessly close distance or risk total annihilation. In a way, the Dawi tried and true warfare is similar to that of a series of kill zones. First, you draw on the enemy with heavy, accurate artillery fire. Then at mid-range, you utilize thunderers and quarrelers to thin out the enemy even further. And if any make it to your actual infantry, they still have to worry about the elite warriors to contend with, and of course, the constant barrage of projectiles launching from behind the dwarven line. In a way, it is a war of attrition, and the dwarves hold all the best cards when they can force the enemy to fight on their own terms. Of course, this is not always possible. In Warhammer, there are many races that can take to the skies, circumventing the holding line, or possess heavy shock cavalry that can take the punishment of skirmishing fire, hit the main line, and continue through into the back line, or simply charge and retreat, wearing down the dwarves with their lack of mobility. This is where dwarven engineering comes into play. They are able to circumvent all of their weaknesses with their sheer tenacity and skill with machinery. Particularly in this instance, the gyrocopters and gyro bombers come into play as they give the Dawi the flexibility they need to force the enemy into the battle they need them to engage in by chasing away cavalry and dispersing um, chaff troops with heavy ordnance from rather unexpected angles, usually above, where they cannot or have not fortified. In fact, I would say that the Dawi have the most uniform and straightforward tactics for war in all of Warhammer. Honestly, it's just pummel the enemy with constant artillery and skirmishing fire and then break them on your heavily armored troops. It's a simple style of fighting and why well, some might call it, uh, let's just say cowardly. <laughs> if you're playing Total War, they probably uh, shouldn't say that to a Dawi's face. This style does take advantage of the dwarf's strengths and both protects their already dwindling numbers as well as inflicts the maximum amount of enemy casualties before any dwarves are even under threat, uh, for the most part. Now, of course, there are exceptions to this with factions that possess the same amount of artillery, and these battles typically devolve into counter-battery fire until one side loses the advantage and is enforced to engage which 
I would give the Dawi an advantage in close quarters combat over almost every race, bearing a few of the more exotic enemies, let's just call them that. And of course the Dawi distant kin and the Chaos Dwarfs, which have not yet made it into Total War, but they would definitely give the standard dwarfs a run for their money. But enough about tactics and strategy, let's get into the actual army of the Keres Angkor. Starting with the infantry, and I will be basically taking passages from the army books here, reading them aloud, and then adding to it with um, bits of lore and things like that that I've come away with, as well as making comparisons to Total War Warhammer. What better place to start than with the standard Dwarven infantry? Specifically, Dwarf Warriors, which are the most common frontline infantry in all of the holds. They form the overall bulk of most dwarf armies. In times of war, the leaders of the clan call the muster of any dwarfs old enough to fight to form together into uh, regiments. Most of the individuals that will answer the call to arms are craftsmen of some sort, uh, stone carvers, brewers, mentors, and the like. But once they don their well-forged mail, put on their steel helm, and heft an axe in hand, they leave behind the artisan, turning that same industrious nature to their other calling. Warfare. Dwarfs make formidable fighters. They are strong and extremely resilient, broad of shoulder and wide of girth. Although they are by no means quick, they are physically robust and can maintain a steady plodding pace, marching for days on end despite being loaded down by burdens and heavy mail. When they charge into battle, the momentum generated by their wide, armor-clad bodies is remarkable. Hitting the foe with resounding force, they have broken many enemy battle lines this way, splintering elven phalanxes, carving through orc formations, and hacking apart the great masses of Skaven that make up their verminous armies. Dwarf warriors are the bulk of the Dawi line, and they are known to actually be a very formidable force even against more elite troops as Dawi are natural born warriors, as we just heard meaning that dwarf warriors pose a significant threat to any army that wants to engage in melee combat. As what is most armies would be a standard holding force in the dwarf army is something more akin to a mid to high tier infantry of other races, meaning the dwarf warriors can punch well above what their supposed weight class should be. Though in a way all Dwarven units come in limited numbers and are expensive, uh, much like the elves. They have, about, they have a similar uh, number count in Total War, that is. And it would be a similar um, idea in the lore and how the tabletop is supposed to work. <clears throat> As they are considered a dwindling race and their equipment is far superior to the average run-of-the-mill Empire soldier. Speaking of gear, in most holds, despite some of the extremely wealthy ones, um, Armor and weaponry is expected to be furnished by the individual dwarf or their family, which kind of makes uh, dwarf warriors almost like state troops, but of a much higher caliber. And for the most part, this isn't a problem, as wearing the armor of your ancestors ties you in a way um, to their style of warship that they already possess. In Total War, we get two variants of dwarf warriors, the standard axe and shield, and a two-handed great axe version. The shielded version is excellent against low to mid-tier infantry that isn't heavily armored and will trade with even some elite troops uh, that don't have um, very heavy armor as well. Though the great weapon variant would be more useful in this aspect as they have the armor piercing quality associated with massive weapons, but at the loss of a shield, so susceptible to missile fire. Though it should be noted that even the unshielded dwarf warriors have some of the highest armor for a regular infantry in the game, period. And they can take considerable skirmishing fire for a rather long amount of time as long as it isn't armor piercing, so that's not always a problem. As well, the morale of most dwarves is very high, with the, the warriors and the next group being of a uh, somewhat lower caliber, but still high when compared to your average army in um, Total War. Next, we have the Dwarf Miners, which are those irregular band of dwarfs that Ansela call to battle, outwit outfitted with tools of their trade, such as mining equipment, pickaxes, mattocks, and boxes of lethal dynamite. 
Dwarves have an insatiable thirst for gold, and their miners construct deep shafts in the heart of the mountains to their quest to acquire the valuable metal. They also mine for ores and gemstones and are very skilled at digging tunnels at rather incredible speed. The network of mines and tunnels run through every mountain range in battle. They use their knowledge of the tunnels and mastery of the heavy two-handed pickaxe with deadly intent. Miners are an interesting unit in the dwarf roster as they are not as combat effective as your standard dwarf warrior, but at least in tabletop they were excellent at helping to spring an unexpected ambush as they could literally come from anywhere on the table. Of course there are constraints in total war for that, but they do have the vanguard deployment option. Of course being dwarfs they don't exactly move fast, <laughs> but they can surprise an enemy unit tunneling under the battlefield and harrying an enemy artillery crew for example is something unexpected from the Dawi normally which makes them an effective unit when used properly. With that being said, in Total War, miners are not exactly a great uh, unit, but the other variant we get with blasting charges are much more effective in your average combat scenario. And both of these do exist in the tabletop, and of course then some. The blasting charges allow the lowly miners to cripple a unit closing into melee with themselves, or a unit they may be behind, as they do make an excellent uh, flanking, or they do also do very well at breaking up chaff units with their explosive charges to absorb a charge. Though with their price tag, they are not intended as chaff themselves, even if they are often used as such, especially in multiplayer. <laughs> However, in campaign, miners have a bit of a hidden gem of an ability in that they are excellent at tunneling through defenses. And they can hack through a fortress ga gate, um, quicker than even a battering ram, making them ideal for sieges when the Dawi are on the offensive, something that usually uh, they're not exactly the best at. They're more of a hold the line kind of force, not usually a attack force. So they do make very good troops when it comes to actually tunning through those um, big fortress gates. Next, we have the Dwarven Longbeards, which are the oldest and most battle-hardened warriors within a Dwarven army. Highly prestigious individuals, these Longbeards garner great respect within a Dwarf stronghold. They are often chosen to be the leaders and advisors of many domestic issues and military campaigns. Only a Dwarf who has reached the age of 500, or has a beard that is touching the very floor, will be readily considered a Longbeard. This ensures that they receive the proper respect from other dwarfs, who have been taught at an early age, and quite rightfully so, to always respect their elders and listen to their well-earned wisdom. And if you saw my video on Dawi Society, you will know that age, and therefore beards, are very important show of status in a Dawi hold. And therefore, a hold long beards will often act as a collective advisor to the king of the hold. And the king had best listen to his long beards, or hear their very skilled grumbling until the end of his days, should he make a uh, unwise decision. Not only are Longbeard's seasoned veterans, but in tabletop they also inspired nearby troops to uh, greater feats of valor and honor. This is also true in Total War, as we get two variants of the Longbeards similar to the Dwarf Warriors. A shield and axe, and a great weapon version with a two-handed axe. Of course, they do have better stats than your Dwarf Warrior units, but they are quite a bit more expensive and are supposed to be used as an anchor and a line, as they will damn near never break, and they give a leadership buff to nearby units, similar to a hero or a general. Meaning that you won't need to march your heroes around the map trying to shore up a line, which can be problematic given the lack of speed of your average Dawi. And for the most part, Longbeards would be considered a kind of middle heavy infantry, but easily can take on elite troops from most factions, as long as they lack that armor-piercing quality. And then we move on to probably some of the most elite infantry in the Dawi roster, in the Dwarven Ironbreakers, which are amongst the most heavily armored warriors fielded by the armies of the Dwarfs. Clad from head to toe with full suits of magnificent Grom real armor and rune weapons, these warriors are considered by many to be the elite of the elite. Many dwarf strongholds have deep tunnels, which the dwarfs have long since abandoned. 
these tunnels have become home to all kinds of monsters such as night goblins, skaven, trolls, and even more sinister horrors. Where old and abandoned workings join the inhabited levels, the dwarfs have docked passages and built gates, but even so they must be constantly on the lookout for intrusion from below. The iron breakers guard these old passages and protect the stronghold from attack. They spend much of their time below ground in the deepest, least visited parts of the stronghold. Because of the extreme danger of their duties, they wear heavy grumble armor engraved with runes. Now, iron breakers are the ultimate defense in Warhammer and also in Total War. Just period. They sport some of the highest defensive stats due to their long careers defending the depths for days or months on end, and have the best armor the doll we can provide, making them the stalwart machines of death that they are so famed for. From a lore perspective, being an ironbreaker is almost akin to being a hero in Dawi society. It is seen as one of the highest honors, and typically the position is passed down through generations, as the armor will <laughs> outlast its wearer, even in defeat. They are typically armed with a shield and an axe, and can outlast almost any kind of infantry, as long as they lack that high damage, high armor piercing quality as they specialize in hewing down unarmored foes, and will do so indefinitely, as they will never break, nor will they surrender. Of course, in Total War, that is not exactly the case, but it is close. Their defensive stats and their armor is also insane. Only approached by a unit of Chosen from the Chaos roster in the sheer thickness, and they are damn near unbreakable. They are utilized as an immovable object, and as an added bonus in Total War, they also have blasting charges they unleash as enemies close in to melee with them, very similar to the um, miners, making them even more effective at hewing chaff and holding key points of a line until you can rally forces to aid them. Though, with them being the elite of the elite, they also have the elite of the elite price sticker <laughs> so they are rather expensive units to field so when you are fielding them in a multiplayer uh, game more than likely if you get to the point where you can afford them in single player money doesn't matter at that point but in multiplayer fielding a unit of iron breakers is investing a lot into a, uh, a solid infantry core Whereas opposed, you might be able to get two or maybe close to three Dwarven Warrior units. So it is a heavy investment, but often worthwhile depending on what you're up against and what you what your battle strategy is. So, And then next, we have the Dwarf Hammers, which form a Dwarven King's personal bodyguard. Chosen by the King himself, they are individuals from different units and perhaps even clans whom have proven themselves in uncountable battles, showing not just great strength and deadly martial prowess, but also steadfast loyalty and a bold and courageous nature. They are formed into a hard-hitting shock unit, a force capable of breaking enemy formations, the way a heavy warhammer crushes shale. In addition to being a formidable fighting unit, the hammers are often used as a thane or lord's personal bodyguard. Due to a liege is a uh, duty, excuse me, duty to a liege is a sacred thing to dwarfs. An individual bound by oath is to the lord will fight all the harder. And for the leader of the throng, a hammer will gladly give his life rather than face the dishonor of failure. A king surrounded by his hammerers is the keep in the center of a throng, grim and unyielding, a living personification of the indomitable dwarf spirit. Of course, the allegiance goes both ways, and it is a lord's duty to properly equip these hand-picked units and to seal the oath between them. As you can see from that passage, the hammers are the cream of the crop, the elite of elite, and an already elite infantry-based army, making them superb troops nonetheless. And as you also heard, it is one of the few units that is actually outfitted by the king himself, as they would be um, bodyguards, or by the thane, or so on and so forth, whoever is fielding these units. As far as lore is concerned, 
Hammers are typically elite guards and will be utilized to guard uh, perhaps an important gate not held by the iron breakers or they will guard the throne room or dwelling of whoever they serve. Of course in battle they guard whoever they're supposed to guard be it a king, a thang, a prince, so on and so forth. And this is more has to do with tabletop rules as you can actually embed a unit into a unit and there were bonuses associated with that. So that's how a lot of this carries over into uh, tabletop. Now it is seen as a great and honorable duty um, and the respect afforded to a hammer is almost the same as that of who, whom they serve. Meaning that a great responsibility is also placed on the hammer to be the best and serve the oath to the fullest. Now they of course are wearing Gromril armor but unlike the Iron Breakers, they wield a massive two-handed Warhammer, therefore foregoing the protection of a shield. This does make them more vulnerable to missile fire, as we can see in Total War, <laughs> but they make up for this in both armor piercing and very high offensive stats. Uh, for a dwarf, that is. They will chew through elite troops in a straight-up fight, Though that is the problem, at least in uh, Total War, that I have come across. It is very rare that they even get to said fight without taking significant damage from enemy artillery and skirmishers, as your opponents also know how deadly hammerers can be. So they are not utilized as much for that reason, and also because they are one of the most expensive units in Total War to field even more expensive than iron breakers so they are a heavy investment but they are also an investment that will more than likely possibly make you a decent return if they manage to get into melee so they are a bit of a two-sided coin you won't see them used very often but if they are used and used expertly they can be a devastating unit on the field of battle and that's about it for the standard infantry now we get into some of the more unique infantry <laughs> <laughs> well, you the only unique infantry, really, in the Slayers, which are the strangest and most deadly of all the Dwarf Warriors. They are outlandish doom seekers, individuals whom have wholly dedicated their entire fiber of their being to the hardest and most destructive life of battle that they can possibly find. Dwarfs are a proud people, and none of them cope well with failure or personal tragedy, no matter how small. The loss of a single family member or a hoard of treasures is inconsolable to a dwarf, a fate that can seriously unhinge their obsessive minds. Eventually these burdens become far too heavy to bear and a dwarf would eventually snap, making him forswore the fellowship and comforts of family clan and hold, opting instead for a life of self-imposed exile, having broken ties with everything that they once held dear. These dwarfs leave behind all possessions save for their own axes, and take the Slayer Oath. Now, I have made an entire video on the Slayer Cult, so feel free to watch that for a more in-depth breakdown of Slayers, because they are very interesting. But um, as far as this video is concerned, Slayers are the most unique and crazy aspect of the Dwarf faction in Warhammer, in my personal opinion. They personify what it is to be a Dawi, at least in my opinion as well. And the sheer amount of destruction they can rend is impressive. Now, they do not have to wield any weapon in particular in the lore. And in tabletop, there are different kinds of slayers that are better at certain things. As far as Total War is concerned, we have gotten access to the Troll Slayer, which are simply called slayers, and the Giant Slayers with massive two-handed axes. The two-handed axes having significantly more armor piercing for those extra tough beasts and super heavy cavalry. Now, the Slayers act as an equalizing force for something the dwarves are severely lacking, and that is anti-large. That is mostly due to the fact that all dwarves believe that spears and anything spear-like is an elf weapon. Pitiful. Weak and they won't use it. <laughs> so they severely lack in any kind of anti-large um, infantry. So the Slayers are their go-to for that. Sure, they have artillery and skirmishers for days, which can work, 
but when a large monstrosity or heavy cavalry unit actually makes it to the Dawi line, casualties can be significant. In fact, it is one of the dwarf's biggest weaknesses is the lack of stopping power when it comes to large entities. Chariots can run ridiculous amounts of casualties up against dwarves, as whereas super heavy cavalry and of course something like a giant or a dragon which is why the almighty slayers are both fast for a dwarf and are the only unit that deals anti-large damage and they do it rather well as they have a fairly high metal count and of course a fairly high rate of damage but on the flip side they are you know bare skinned there's no armor <laughs> whatsoever which is highly unusual for dwarfs obviously and they also have very low defensive stats as they're not protecting themselves. So you have to take special care to keep them away from skirmishers and they do not do well against enemy infantry. They are meant specifically to face giant monsters. Now they are the only force the dwarves have to rebuff flying units um, when they hit the ground, especially the likes of dragons and other massive monstrosities or to even just slow them down the likes of Heavy Chariots and Super Heavy Cav. At least in multiplayer, they are almost a staple in every dwarf army out of necessity. Though in my own personal campaigns and whatnot, I, if I'm ever playing as the Dawi, I love to field several dwarves in an army just, just for posterity's sake, for, you know, the sheer joy of it, because they're, they're so lovely to watch just hack through enemies. And uh, I just find them very interesting, and they are extremely iconic for Warhammer in general. And uh, yeah, if, if anybody knows about oaths and grudges and whatnot, they probably know what a Slayer is. So it's just one of those very interesting units that I have a, uh, a deep kin to, I guess, <laughs> in a strange way. And then we are done with the standard infantry of the Dawi, and we will move on to the Skirmishers. And who better to start with than the Quarrelers? Dwarf Quarrelers serve as dedicated regiments of heavily armored skirmishers and missile infantry for the armies of the Dwarfs. Since the Dwarfs first settled upon the treacherous slopes of the World's Edge Mountains, the Dwarfs required a means to drive out the many ferocious beasts that occupy its peaks at a long and safe distance. This dilemma has resulted in the creation of the very first crossbow, as traditional bows used by, for instance, the High Elves, were far too large to be properly used and lacked greatly in proper hitting power. Such is the versatility of the crossbow that it has little need for improvements, as it has had enough stopping power to drop a black orc in its tracks. When the clans are called to fight, some dwarfs arm themselves with crossbows and join the battle as quarrelers. These formations are tasked with raining bolts down upon their foes, a task they perform with orderly zeal. Corlers seek to thin down the enemy's ranks, punish units attempting to outflank their own forces, and engage in ranged duels with foes' missile-armed troops. As you can see, the Corlers is a unit of heavily armored, armor-piercing, shielded, ranged death dealers. <laughs> and yes, they are all of those in one. They are extremely important to the dwarfs as they allow them to shoot over the top of their front lines without risking any friendly fire. Not only that, but they can outlast almost any enemy skirmishers, even those that by all rights should outclass them, simply from their high armor and the heavy shields that they wield even while firing. The only thing that might even come close would be Dark Shards from the um, Dark Elf roster. Now, in Total War, these are your go-to skirmishing unit. They are relatively cheap, and unlike most skirmishing units, Dwarf Curlers will actually hold their own in melee, with stats similar to that of Dwarf Warriors. And yes, that makes them extremely difficult to deal with when, opposed, when opposing the Dwarves. Which means that even if you do damage, uh, manage to get a fast light cavalry unit into the back lines, there is exactly uh, no guarantee that they won't get beat down in hand-to-hand -hand combat with Corlers, even without the aid of any other nearby units. So they are a very dangerous and unique unit in Total War as they can easily defend themselves and they are extremely devastating at range. So they're very unique in that aspect. 
And then we move on to the Thunderers. Now, it took many, many years after the dwarfs had discovered the revolutionary use of black powder before the handgun became widely used as a weapon. Indeed, in these earlier times, these handguns were held with great suspicion by the highly conservative dwarfs, with the earlier prototypes usually being only given to dwarven engineers. Now, however, nearly all the dwarf holds with in the Karazhan Corps can now field whole regiments of Thunderers, the name given to the handgun equipped units. Standing in closely packed ranks, Thunderers take aim and then discharge their handguns, unleashing a thunderous fury and a cloud of gun smoke. Although no quite as long ranged as crossbows, the sturdy dwarf handgun packs an even deadlier shot. It's bullet fired with such velocity it can tear through armor and, b and better take down even more heavily protected foes, such as Chaos Warriors. Now, despite that description, Thunderers have existed for hundreds of years, if not more. And this has led to a bitter rivalry between Quarrelers and Thunderers as to who is the best ranged units for the Dawi army. It never goes so far as to actual, you know, outright bloody murder between the two but a few tavern brawls have broken out regardless of uh, happenstance thunderers are a high damage very high armor piercing skirmishing unit though the drawback is the reload speed <laughs> however then being stalwart dowie they are much more efficient than your average empire handgunner and can easily fire up until they are literally engaged in melee and much like the Corlers, they also are decent fighters in melee. In Total War, they serve the exact same purpose as they do would in Tabletop, and also as Corlers this time, with a more armor-piercing um, emphasis than the Corlers, that is. However, they are shooting handguns. They shoot in a straight line, and that has been a severe problem in Total War for quite some time. They've had issues with them not shooting over the tops of troops, even though they had clear line of sight. And so that has led to them being a touchy unit, a very micro-intensive unit because of the lack of fire. Unless you're going up against a um, army that consists of large monstrosities, in which case you won't have to worry about shooting over your troops when you can literally just shoot above them. And that seems to work fine. But other than that, Thunderers and Quarrelers are relatively similar. And the next unit is actually one of my favorites in the Rangers that are long, the long-ranged eyes and ears of most dwarf settlements. They patrol far from safety of the hold, often spending long periods out in the wilderness, keeping watch on the dwarfs' many enemies and tracking dangerous beasts. The Rangers are the unsung heroes of the Karazhan Corps. They often go completely unappreciated, and they are very good at what they do. And what they do is not very nice. <laughs> that was just, sorry, that was a little joke for me. But, but seriously, rangers are the eyes and ears of the holds, and they indiscriminately protect Dawi and the Karasan Corps at large. They are often employed by a particular hold, but similar to any Dawi, they are loyal to their people as a whole before their individual holds. Though these dwarfs are seen as strange, as they spend the majority of their lives above ground. And that is just not natural for a dwarf. It goes against their very nature. So they are seen with uh, high suspicion and not given the respect that they honestly do deserve, even though they have one of the most important jobs. Now, in the lore, rangers are extremely stealthy, and they utilize crossbows. A relatively quiet method, as they are almost like um, Dawi Special Forces, in a way. They travel light, for a dwarf, and are unnaturally quiet. In the way of, uh, in the War of the Beard, they even were known to even take the hated Elgi by surprise. That's quite a feat to take in elves. Um, in Total War, they have the stock ability to represent this. And they also have the Vanguard Deployment ability, meaning you can actually set up ambushes with them. Though... They are quicker than your average dwarf. They're still dwarfs. They're not exactly sprinters. So they require a bit of finesse if you're trying to spring a very thorough ambush, that is, if you don't want to just take someone by surprise. Now, we do get um, three variants, actually, in Total War. 
we get a variant, just standard variant with crossbows. Then we get a variant with throwing axes, which is um, high armor piercing damage. A much shorter range, but high armor piercing damage, which is very interesting. And then we also get a hold of the mythical Bugman's Rangers, which are essentially crossbow units, uh, the same kind of as the regular Rangers with crossbows. But they also have a kind of regeneration effect as they take damage. Um, and they are also very decent in melee, uh, more so than the average Ranger. Though it should be said that pretty much all of the Dwarven units outside of artillery are um, very good in melee. In fact, the Rangers are in a very unique place, as the Dawi are not usually known as stealthy and can often surprise an enemy. Though they are not exactly the fastest, they are probably the most vulnerable um, of all of the foot slogging units <laughs> that represent the Dawi outside of, of course, artillery, due to their lack of armor, as they don't wear as much heavy armor as the average dwarf course they are a very interesting unit to me i find them fascinating but enough about them let's move on to one even more strange and even more iconic in my opinion in the iron drakes the creation of the drake gun came out when the bitter underground wars that the dwarves fought daily had begun to evolve into a new level of intensity as their enemies began to discover diabolical ways to break a stronghold's already formidable defenses However, the dwarf's stout defiance and powerful wound weapons and armor have turned back the dark tide time and time again. Beaten yet unbroken, their enemies have adapted, and in response to the heavily armored iron breakers, the Skaven have developed teams of warp fire throwers or globadiers as a countermeasure, whilst the night goblins send in mobs of fanatics or trolls to punch a hole in their lines. For the dwarfs, this was a war of attrition, and it was costing far too many lives to continue. In response, the dwarf engineers of Zufbar invented new weapons that can deter these countermeasures with blazing efficiency. <laughs> the Drake gun was one such invention, a weapon so powerful that once it is fired, the entire tunnelway will be lit with alchemical fire that will burn for many hours afterwards. Such a weapon allowed the Iron Breakers to cut off key positions within the tunnels beneath a hold from a much more superior threat, such as an onrushing charge of enraged mongrel squids, or a whole battalion of heavily armored storm vermin. Iron Breakers who showed an aptitude with the Drake Gun were further trained and formed into new units. When first used, even the Gromreal armor of the Iron Breakers struggled to protect the user against the intense heat generated by the weapon. In response, runesmiths have begun to imbue new armor suits with runes of protection against extreme heat, enabling these iron breakers to endure the heat of their own weapons and those warp fire throwers sent by the Skavens. And they also developed beard armor, which is awesome, <laughs> to say the least. <laughs> iron drakes are a very new development as far as war is concerned, though their alchemical fire in the lore dates back to the War of the Beard, at least a version of it. As you can see, the Iron Drakes are actually Iron Breakers and are paired with them. This is not exactly the case for Total War, as the, they don't have a lot of paired units in that way, but they are their own unit, and a bit of an odd one. The problem is the range and the line of sight, much similar to the issue that we have with any handgun unit. Now, it is much better in Total War Warhammer 2 than it was in the original Total War, but they are still extremely expensive and often only have a very limited niche when fighting factions that are either going to swamp you with chaff that you can burn away with essentially napalm, or have a vulnerability to fire, such as any of the vampire count units. Either way, their uses are limited, and even in campaign, can take quite a bit of time to get access to meaning they are essentially late game units that exceed at taking out early game chaff. So in a way, they're often overshadowed by more useful skirmishers, such as just thunderers or even artillery, as they will get more kills than your average unit of iron drakes. But they are thematic, they are a fun unit, and that should be considered when judging their value, as they are interesting to watch lay waste to swaths of ratkin and the like. 
but all in all, I would say a kind of uh, mediocre unit at best. And now we move on to some actual Dawi artillery in the bolt thrower. Dwarf engineers still vie with each other to invent bolt throwers with greater range, loading speed, or accuracy. Practical to a fault, the dwarfs place more trust in an old proven bolt thrower that has fired reliably for generations. The bolt thrower remains an important part of the dwarf arsenal because it can be built and maintained cheaply, which we should all know is very important to dwarfs as they are uh, the epitome of misers. And it is accurate enough to bring down monsters such as wyverns or trolls with a well-judged shot. Its direct trajectory of fire and uncomplicated mechanisms also enable it to be used effectively underground and without obscuring everything in a choking cloud of smoke. <laughs> so, the dwarf bolt thrower is simply a bolt thrower. I've gone over bolt throwers in the plast. It does have a bit higher reload speed and one of the very few true anti-large, actual anti-large units that the Dell we have at their disposal in Total War. But other than that, it's just a bolt thrower, guys. You know what a bolt thrower is. You've seen them countless times. <laughs> so let's move on. To the Grudge Thrower, also known simply as a stone thrower or catapult. They are powerful and destructive weapons that, large lo that lob large boulders high into the air, sending them crashing through enemy ranks, crushing limbs and armor alike. Grudge Throwers were originally simple stone throwers used to command the approaches to dwarf holes for many millennia. It was during the War of Vengeance that the practice of inscribing grudges on the rocks to be used as ammunition developed. So great was the fury of the dwarves at the betrayal of the elves. Now, much like bolt throwers, the grudge thrower is simply a catapult. With a little bit of a lore twist with the, the grudges being scribed on all of the pieces of um, ammunition. It has no significant effect <laughs> in Total War. Other than the actual Goblobber, which is super interesting, where it actually uh, launches live goblins attached to rocks and uh, does a bit of morale damage. But that's a special case. For the most part, a Grudge Thrower is just a catapult. A very long-range, effective weapon. Um, in campaign, at least in Total War, it is the first piece of artillery <laughs> you will no doubt get a hold of. And it reliably inflicts massive casualties, um, specifically geared towards infantry, anti-infantry, and less about hitting cavalry or large enemies, as it's not the most accurate when firing um, at fast units. Though it can do significant damage if it ever does lay a hit. However, the next unit has no such problem in the dwarf cannons which are the most common artillery pieces used by all the armies of the Dawi. The first prototype cannons were first invented by dwarf engineers within the workshops of Zufbar, although now many of the larger strongholds have the know-how to make their own, one of the most potent of war machines. A dwarf cannon can shatter the most heavily armored foe, rain barrages into massive enemy formations, and topple the largest of monsters with great accuracy. Though these cannons are noticeably smaller than their human counterparts, they are nonetheless just as deadly and far more accurate. They are, however, somewhat temperamental devices, and even the best forged cannons in the world, such as those made by the dwarfs, are subject to occasional malfunction on the battlefield. Such malfunctions, such as the slightest crack or premature ignition of black powder, can result in devastating accidents. Now, I will say this is super rare. Usually, Dwarven engineering is flawless. And this is just due to tabletop, uh, any black powder weapon, even the Dwarves with black powder weapons having a slight chance of malfunctioning. Whereas in the lore, Dwarven engineering lasts millennia. Um, it is usually good to go no matter what. <laughs> so, it's a, it's a little bit of a uh, back and forth, but um, that's just to make the game fair. Now, the Dawi are known for their artillery, and of course, the cannon is key. In Total War, cannons are extremely long-range, armor-piercing monstrosities that are excellent at killing large monsters and taking out groups of cavalry. They also don't do too bad against heavily armored um, infantry, though their prime niche is that of anti-large, so they are much better at hunting down bigger targets. Of course, they can also be used to take out infantry, but uh, their firing arc prevents them from shooting too closely over your own front line. 
So if you are going to target infantry, you have to target it from the get-go, because otherwise you will either have some friendly fire or you'll have the unfortunate um, blocking of the firing arc, and therefore your cannon will just sit there doing nothing. <laughs> so yeah, there is that. Next up, we have the organ gun, which names de derives from the pipes of a musical organ instrument, which the array of barrels resemble. The engineer who first pioneered this machine was a dwarf by the name of Locri Snarrison. I probably didn't say that properly, but you get the idea. Who invented the very first musical organ instrument. It was then that a never dwarf engineer by the name of Durin Kurgensan, Kurgensan, son, <laughs> dang it, thought of the idea of laying these pipes flat and using them as cannon barrels. He called it the organ gun, and as a few engineers liked it so much that they copied his designs for newer models. Since then, the organ gun has evolved into the war machine it is known as of today. Typically, the organ's cannon barrels are smaller and lighter than those used in standard cannonry, meaning it lacks the range and firepower of conventional artillery. However, the Orger gun makes up for this disadvantage by being able to fire multiple shots at the enemy, able to literally tear apart an entire regiment of soldiers, so the crew get within adequate range. Now, as you can see from that passage, the organ gun has an interesting founding, and also a very different use, um, even in Total War. The organ gun is absolutely devastating to enemy infantry. The most problem is that it has a very uh, relatively short range and very limited firing arc, meaning that like the most artillery, unless positioned expertly, you will not see much use out of the organ gun once the lines have been met and melee has started. Unless there are a few large targets to chew through, <laughs> which it also does excel at. It is a fantastic weapon. Um, very, very problematic to deal with if you're opposing the, the Dawi. Mostly you have to either send in chaff to eat up ammunition and hope that it doesn't target your more expensive units or find some way to get around it without it firing at you or tie it down with something because that's just how devastating an organ gun can be once you get into close range. Which then leads us on to the last of the true artillery pieces for the Dawi with the Flame Cannon, which is a volatile concoction of hot oil and molten tar mixed within the flame cannons before air is pumped into the barrel. Soon the pressure inside is tremendous and the barrel is almost ready to burst. At precisely the right moment, the dwarves place a burning oily wad into the nozzle and release the pressure. The mixture catches fire as it whooshes from the barrel in a leaping spurt. The burning oil arcs into the air towards the enemy ranks, and with a bit of luck, lands in the middle of the foe, spraying boiling tar over them. And then for longer range shots, the dwarfs simply apply more pressure. The most experienced crew know exactly when to release the straining valves to achieve maximum distance. Those crews who misjudge the settlable balance rarely get another chance to do so. Enemies struck by flame cannons have their flesh literally melted off them in slough, leaving only scorched bones and a foul-smelling liquid that is best described as... goo. Even the bravest of those who survive after seeing their comrades so gruesomely reduced have known to flee immediately. I love flame cannons. It is a devastating weapon, to say the least, as is all... Dawi artillery. I'm sure you're tired of me saying that. Unfortunately, like many of the interesting Dawi units, it suffers from a lack of performance. <laughs> so, without expert um, micromanaging. The range is simply not there. And though the explosion and fire damage are fantastic, the price tag and lack of accuracy make it not exactly worth taking over, let's say, another cannon. Or perhaps two units of corollers. <sighs> However, much like the Iron Drakes, it can be highly effective in certain matchups and can utterly delete infantry units in, uh, if the projectile hits just right. It also is very good at taking out enemy skirmishers if they close with your, uh, your Dwarven line. So, it does have some uses, it's just it's a very expensive single piece of equipment. 
and therefore, uh, well, it's not a single piece, excuse me. There's more than one cannon. But it, it costs so much, it's just a high value target, and you won't see it that often, is what I'm getting at. Um, it's hard to use because of the limited range, and it will, however, unlike most of their artillery pieces, there are, uh, I've had several cases of massive amounts of friendly fire <laughs> due to the inaccuracy once enemies get too close to your front line. But enough about the flame cannon. Let's move on to something a little bit more interesting. Technically still kind of artillery-esque, we move on to the gyrocopter, whose war machines use a revolutionary rotor blade steam engine that allows it to take off into the air and then land vertically or even hover on the spot, becoming the first technological marvel to achieve the ability of flight. Uh... That might be a misnomer because there actually were blimps and something similar in the War of the Beard. So, tit for tat. <laughs> the first gyrocopter was invented and then improvised upon by dwarf engineers. And due to its rarity, only trusted members of the Engineers Guild is allowed to maintain and operate one. The inventors of this machine were first inspired by observing wild dragons swooping down from mountain ranges. They combined the idea of wings with that of engines used to drive drilling machines and flywheels from grinding machines, which would eventually be the basis for the steam engine that powers the rotors. After several centuries of constant calibrations and revision, the first proper prototype was met with great success. The earlier models were made mostly of canvas and lightweight metal. But as time went on, the newer variants became far more heavily armored and sported an improved hull and, of course, weaponry. The gyrocopter is a very interesting addition to the dwarf roster, mostly because it kind of fills a role that the Dawi also lack in, um, which is cavalry. Dwarfs are slow in general, and hunting down enemy units or harassing cavalry can be difficult if your artillery isn't facing the right direction. So, the gyrocopters act both as scouts and as fast-moving light skirmishing, almost kind of cavalry. From the air, of course. Now, it is important to note that in Total War we get two versions of the gyrocopter. One with a steam cannon, and one with a brimstone gun. In the lore, almost every gyrocopter would have a steam cannon. It's almost like a part of the engine. And they would also then have a brimstone gun if they had a brimstone gun if they were outfitted with one, um, that is. But in Total War, they're separated, probably for micro sake and just, you know, for logical sense, so you can pick between the two, as uh, they also are capable of dropping bombs, um, a limited number of bombs. Um, they are difficult to manage, uh, mostly due to their fragility, despite being heavily armored. Uh, but despite how it looks and its decent armor, it can be shredded very easily in any kind of melee fight with any air, air unit. And I do mean any unit, as I've even had Felbats um, completely shut down and even almost kill <laughs> a gyrocopter. This means that if the enemy has any flyers, your gyrocopter will need to be screened or skirmished um, appropriately, and hopefully not become useless in the process. Of course, the steam gun variant is good against unarmored infantry units, that's specifically what it's good at, but it can also be used to instantly target a unit from behind, causing significant morale damage as you simply fly over your main line and fire into the enemy's back. Something that many people, when they're going against dwarves, don't think of, because often they're not fast enough to actually flank <laughs> any armies. The brimstone, gun, the brimstone gun, on the other hand, is designed for large targets and is capable of armor piercing, which means that it excels chipping away at monsters and enemy heavy cavalry. And it also will do decently against heavily armored infantry, though it does specialize in anti-large. As long as it isn't moving too fast, that is. Which then leads us into the gyro bombers. Now, initial test against rampaging orcs proved successful. With the newly dubbed gyro bomber sowing patches of destruction along its flight path, however, 
While the bombs didn't rip holes into the waves of oncoming attackers, the newly designed flying machine was not as capable of diving down to launch its bombs as was the gyrocopter. And furthermore, the larger bombs proved more susceptible to wind shear. All of this meant that the devastating payload was not always delivered on target. Teams of engineers advanced a slew of ideas, one of which turned out to increase the bomb's damage potential. By reading the explosive content within the bomb's canister, the engineers found they could set off a brief chain reaction, creating a bouncing bomb that would land, explode, and then set off subsequent explosions, named the Grudge Buster Bomb. The engineers were naturally defensive about it, bristling the suggestion that the bombs were less accurate. They stated that the bounces gave the ordnance a greater chance to strike its target. Tests showed that, while the Grudge Buster bombs might not be any more accurate, their multiple explosions wreaked more damage than ever. Now, as you can see, there is a significant difference between gyro bombers from the tabletop and what we've gotten in Total War. For instance, the Grudge Buster bomb is not a thing. <laughs> the bombs dropped from the gyro bomber are the same as the ones you can see being dropped from the gyrocopter. They just simply have a lot more of them. Making them decent for taking out bunched up infantry, um, but at the same time, very taxing to use uh, and aim properly. A lot of micromanagement gets thrown into a gyro bomber. I've actually never seen one used in multiplayer against me or myself. They're simply just too expensive and too hard to use. Which also means that uh, for the for the sheer price, you will I've, you will hardly ever see one. Fortunately, this unit is much more heavily armored um, since it is a single entity. So it will survive some melee skirmishing, though it doesn't exactly deal damage. But it, it will be able to survive a unit of fail bats, for instance. As long as you can help screen it, it won't instantly get uh, deleted <laughs> from the map. And it does come equipped with a steam gun for uh, after it has unloaded its payload, though it is not as fires quickly or uh, do as much damage as the standard steam gun on the gyrocopters. As there are three gyrocopters, there's only one gyro bomber. So it has some severe drawbacks, and honestly, it's, it's in a weird place. And um, if they did a few tweaks, for instance, making the bombs more impressive, like they're supposed to be from the tabletop, I can see the gyrocopter, or the, excuse me, the gyro bomber being much more useful than it is in its current state. Whew. And yes, I know this has been a long one, guys, but we are going to make it through it. <laughs> we are done with artillery of all kinds, and we are moving on to the heroes section. Now, the first hero we will come to is the Thang. Dwarven Thangs are the patriarchs of a dwarf clan and a powerful military leader within the Dwarven army. Each Thang has within him vast experience in combating the enemies of their race often built up over several centuries of constant warfare and strict studies. Dwarf leaders are well tutored in the art of war, learning both from the leaders of their own clans and the venerable runesmiths. When the time comes for them to lead, they will have learned more than most commanders ever know and will have ever tried and tested to on the battlefield many times over. This experience and wisdom is reflected upon their beards, a clear indication that the other dwarfs in the throng would do well to follow their example. When battle is joined, it is the Thanes with their finely crafted armor and rune-inscribed weapons who seek out the enemy's most powerful combatants, matching bestial furry fury or dark magic with courage, honor, and honest steel. On several occasions, dwarf Thanes are known to take command of smaller units of dwarves as their own and lead them personally into combat. Most things are readily identified by their large wings that protrude from their helmets. Now, your thing is very similar to an Empire Captain or any such basic melee hero in Total War. He gives leadership buffs to nearby units, is known to hit decently hard. He's a fairly decent melee combatant, though on the more defensive side, being a dwarf. A favorite tactic for Dowie to use is to run a thing ahead of your line and allow the enemy to cluster around them uh, as their high armor and defensive stats will keep them relatively unharmed from normal infantry and then pepper the enemy with artillery and skirmishers because your thane can take it. 
<laughs> of course, this usually doesn't work against an actual human opponent, but you never know, it might. Outside of that, a thane is good to help brace a falling line, but due to their price and limited use, you will hardly see a thane in multiplayer. Um, they're pretty much going to be a campaign only <laughs> buy, as the next hero is pretty much the only hero you ever see in the Dawi roster in online multiplayer. Which does sadden me a little bit, because I feel like the thing deserves, deserves a little more love than he's getting. However, the runesmiths work spells with their hammercraft, blinding the winds of magic into mighty runes of power. They are a suspicious lot and jealousy protect their secrets kept in their anvils and hammers, guarding the knowledge that allows them to make magic items, weapons, armor, rings, and talismans of greater potency than items wrought by any other mortal race upon the world. Now, I have done an entire video on rune magic and craft, so for more details on runesmiths, feel free to watch that. Now, as far as Total War is concerned, a runesmith is your go-to hero to augment your troops because the runes they bring are great. You, could, you don't get access to magic and this is the only form of magic, pseudo magic, the dwarfs are capable of wielding, which can give access to ward saves, extra armor, and even damage enemy units. Plus, they can help anchor a line similar to the thing, as their melee stats are not exactly half bad. And next we have the Dwarven Engineer. If a dwarf shows a particular aptitude towards machinery, he may be granted an apprenticeship with an engineer's guild, whose duty is to provide the dwarf holds access with the latest of the long line of technological advancements. Most engineers spend much of their time repairing broken components and cursing the shoddy work of the engineer who first constructed it. They are also responsible for the creation of blueprints or schematics for a new potential technology. If the guild thinks a concept is worthy enough, the guild will fund the dwarf with all of the equipment, materials, and help needed. Most inventions never quite take off, but others, such as the legendary gyrocopter, quite literally did. Now, when these dwarfs are called to war, they often employ their services towards a dwarf throng as expert artillerymen, whose main duty is to administrate the well-being of the army's machinery and cannons during combat. On a few occasions, these dwarfs have also been called into service as pilots for gyrocopter squadrons, for only an engineer has the proper knowledge and experience to properly control these machines when taking off. Should these dwarfs be pressed into the front lines, engineers often carry with them an assortment of gadgets and black powder weaponry that they have the uh, potential to devastate an enemy regiment wholesale. The employ they... Uh, they employ their expertise to great effect in combat, shooting blunderbusses, throwing grenades at the enemy, and even calling down artillery bombardments whenever it is needed. In melee, they employ even more explosives or pummel their foes into submission using their engineering spanners and other assorted tools. Now, the Dwarven Engineer in Total War is very similar, and at the same time, not as the version we just heard about in the tabletop. First, they cannot use any gyrocopters, which they should be able to, if we're being honest here. I wish that that would be an option at some point. Maybe it will be. And second, they only get access to a more damaging handgun, a Thunderer rifle. No blunderbuss and no explosives. However, they do keep their affinity for artillery and can boost both the reload rate, damage, and amount of ammunition you bring for your cannons or any artillery for that matter which can make them useful in a few niche builds where there may be counter artillery battery taking place. But similar to the thing for the cost, you will usually never see an engineer outside of campaign because they are outshined by rune magic, of course. Which does make me a little sad as there are not many ranged heroes and the dwarf engineer just looks awesome. <laughs> and by all rights, he should be. But that just isn't the case, as he suffers the aim difficulties of all handguns in Total War, and just is outshined, simply. And that about wraps it up for the heroes, so let's move on to the Lord Choices, starting off with the Dwarf Lord. These spell-handed warriors are equipped with the finest arms and armor within his clan, whom have been known to fight at the forefront of the army, inspiring his comrades in the face of overwhelming odds, as a rule, Dwarf Lords are a grim sort, 
for they are the leaders of a dour people. Upon their broad shoulders is carried the weight of untold debt, the inherited grudges of a long, suffering, and unforgiving race. It is their duty to avenge all wrongdoings in their clan, their hold, and their entire race. Not just in the present, but also for all time. Every dwarf lord started out as a thane, whom are the patriarchs of a dwarf clan. For a thane to progress and become a dwarf lord, he must be well tutored in the ways of his ancient foes, absorb a great wealth of wisdom, and be a barrier of royal blood. Such wisdom includes being a master of tactics and strategy, learning to wield the armored might of their throngs, as well as they wield an axe and shield. All dwarfs take great pride in their possessions, but none of them than the ruling class. Not only is a dwarf lord a potential candidate as the next king of a Karak, since he is bearer of royal blood, he is also, depending on wealth or clan, be equipped with some of the mightiest runic weapons and armor around. It is an honor amongst the dwarfs to bear such relics to war in battle, for each item is passed down from their forefathers, an ancient legacy in its own right. Covered in runes and bristling with arcane might, each of the dwarf holds relics have a long history of great deeds and great feats. You heard the majority of what sets apart a dwarf lord from a thing, and in Total War, it is not much, <laughs> actually. In fact, you will almost never see a dwarf lord in multiplayer, similar to the thing, because the next commander is always used, if not a legendary lord. Now, I would also like to note that there is also a dwarf king listed in the army book, whom stats and principles are the same. Uh, their difference is ne negligible as the uh, dwarf lord. So I'm uh, kind of lumping them together as the he difference is so minute when it comes to actual combat. Though many of your legendary lords would actually fall under the banner of king. And in the lore, even the kings of small Karaks would be considered almost legendary in a way. Or at least heroes at a minimum. In Total War, your dwarf lord is your standard melee general. No outstanding features, unfortunately, and hopefully, maybe someday there will be something added to maybe differentiate different types of melee lords, but as of right now, it's just the standard one lord lore choice, <laughs> and it is uh, unfortunately rather bland. The next lord choice, however, is the rune lord. Now, the rune lords are the greatest of the rune smiths. A rune lord candidate may only be promoted with the death of an existing rune lord. So the position is highly coveted and contested. Among the dwarfs, rune lords are equals to kings. And so they move through dwarf society as some of its most esteemed members. A few rune lords withdraw from the world, sequestering themselves away to learn the deeper secrets of the master runes, and perhaps create a few of their own further diminishing their numbers as their names become legend. Similar in every way to runesmiths, a rune lord is the next step in fame and glory for a runesmith. In Total War, they are simply bigger, better runesmiths, and the only lord you will see outside of a legendary lord. They also are the only Dawi to get a mount in a kind of Dawi palaquin, where they are head aloft by stalwart dwarfs as they sit upon their anvils of doom. Which I suppose CA has tried to kind of implement with their buffed up stats, but the look of the anvil is not exactly what I was suspecting, as it looks almost just like a Dawi Palaquin, similar to the Throne of Power Thorgrim sits upon. Which is a shame, as I think they could have been so much more. Um, also not included is the sheer magnitude of these items, that they have been known to uh, literally, in the lore, rip the earth asunder. And I would love to see something like this added, hopefully, in the next game, or with a DLC of some kind, to further instill the power of the Anvils of Doom. They're supposed to be massive, impressive weapons, and uh, maybe even an overhaul of their look <laughs> might be needed, in my own personal opinion. But um, they are your standard lore choice that you will see in multiplayer outside of the uh, legendary lords. You'll always see these guys that give too many buffs to your army, making them stronger, hit harder, do fire damage, have ward saves, just all kinds of things that um, they're pretty much a no-brainer pick, unfortunately. And the last of our Lord choices is the Master Engineer. Dwarf Master Engineers are the greatest and most intellectual individuals the Engineers Guild has to offer. 
Given the number of war machines with which the dwarfs can equip themselves, it is not surprising to find members of the Engineers Guild accompanying the throng to battle. To most master engineers, this field work is tiresome. It takes them away from their forges and workshops and shows them firsthand how their beloved engines of destruction are dragged into position, dented by enemy shot, and invariably aimed in a manner not as fully optimized as would be ideal. Now, unfortunately, we did not receive these generals as options for Total War as of yet. Though if they were included, they would certainly need a rework, as the current engineer, as I stated previously, is all but useless outside of buffs for artillery <laughs> and skirmishers. I would love to see different ranged options and the ability to make a gyrocopter or gyro bomber and turn it into a monster on the battlefield as the master engineer inhabits it, just making it better in every way. But I have little hope of ever seeing them unless a rework of the engineer takes place then possibly the Dawi will get a little love in that matter. Um, but other than that, that wraps it up for the official army list. We are not missing very many units from the official tabletop roster. There are a couple lower units you might be able to stifle in, but for the most part, um, CA has done an excellent job of including all of the uh, units from the Dwarven roster. The Dawi are one of my personal favorite armies in Total War. I know that might be sacrilege or heresy to some of you, but um, in the original game, they were one of my favorite races to play just because I love artillery, and I've probably gushed plenty <laughs> over the, art, the Dwarven artillery and whatnot. And this has already been a long video, so let's go ahead and start wrapping this up, guys. Um, down in the comment session, make sure to... Um, Tell me, what was your, what's your favorite army? Do you guys appreciate the dwarves? Did I do them justice? Did I not do them justice? Go ahead and leave me comments down below letting me know how you feel. All in all, in my opinion, CA has delivered the entire Dari uh, roster to us in Total War. With the exception of the Dwarf King and the Master Engineer as Lord Options. I don't see those coming anytime soon. The Dwarven King that wouldn't make a lot of sense. It'd be the same thing as the Dwarf Lord. And the Master Engineer, until those engineers get a rework, I just don't see it happening. Oh, and they have not yet included the Dragon Slayer or the Demon Slayer variants for Slayers. Which could either be a new hero in the Demon Slayer or the Dragon Slayer. Or they could add another unit, maybe even a more even beefed up unit um, of Slayers. Uh, it, could, it could happen. It could not happen as well. They could just leave it as is, and uh, it would be all right. Um, I would prefer to get all the Slayers, though. <laughs> Me personally. Though I'm not sure if they were ever uh, make these. Um, like I said, I, I would love the Demon Slayer as a hero unit. Yeah, I think it would be super interesting and give you a, um, a hero that specializes in anti-large. Oh, man, that would, that would do so much <laughs> for the Dwarven roster right now. Um, unlike many factions, the Dwarf roster is almost complete. And for that, I am grateful, though. Uh, with a few minor tweaks, uh, it could be better. So, after that very long-winded explanation of the army of the Dawi, <laughs> I'm going to finally end this lore video, guys. It has been a while since I've done one of these, and I nearly forgot how long they are. Um, I hope you were never bored. and <laughs> Thank you so much if you made it all the way to the end of the video. I would like to say thank you to all of my loyal subscribers for keeping the channel running and of course to anyone watching this content. You guys are keeping me going and all the positivity and all the um, all the likes and the positive comments have really uh, helped me keep this keep the channel running. So I, I appreciate that. If you can go ahead and like this video, it does help me. And if you subscribe to the channel, you can keep up with all the lore and of course all of the other shenanigans I do on this channel. Now, if you are interested in lore in general, you might want to check out my Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, um, where I DM a game of the 4th edition. I have fun doing it, and it's something different for the channel. And um, hopefully, um, you guys, some of you guys will check it out and maybe enjoy it. Oh, and if I made mistakes or missed something entirely, feel free to leave me a comment down in the comment section, and I will do my best to answer or include it in a future video. As usual, guys, I have been Jumbo Thick. Thank you for watching. I look forward to seeing you guys all very soon in my next set of videos. Have a good day.